I'm starting a new painting today. I'm calling it the Guild, but I don't know what paper to use. I normally use cold press watercolor paper for my watercolor paintings, but ever since I started scanning in my ink so you could get free coloring pages, like this, and this, and this, I found that hot press watercolor paper works better because it's so smooth. The ink lines look so nice, see? But the watercolors really kind of just sit on top of the smooth hot press paper, like this. But on cold press, the watercolors look really nice. Unfortunately, the lines get caught up in all of the texture, like this. My gothic vampire painting was done on hot press paper, and I really didn't like the splotchiness of the watercolors. So I went to my local art store and bought really nice hot press watercolor paper that cost $18 a sheet, and I used that for the dragon and centaur painting. And it performed okay, but with all of the erasing that I did, I think I kind of ruined the experience. And I really want to get the right paper for my guild painting, so today I'm going to try testing the expensive hot press watercolor paper without all of the erasing. And I'll also be doing another test on expensive cold press watercolor paper. For the guild painting, I wanted to fill the page with a lot of fantasy characters, with dwarves and elves and everything in between. So for the last few weeks, I've been purchasing photo reference images of different people in different costumes to help me get the right feel for poses and costume designs. I really liked this one, and I think it'll be a good test for the hot press paper. And for those of you asking, I purchased the art reference on ArtStation. This one was called Elf Warrior, and you can get 469 fantastic poses for just $8. And no, this isn't sponsored at all. I paid just like everybody else. With the hot press paper having such a smooth surface, the inking goes on so nicely. I really love how smooth the ink lines are coming out. It just feels like I'm a better inker when I work on smoother paper, if that makes sense. I'm not fighting the tooth of the cold press paper. The pen nib isn't bouncing up and down across all of the bumps and grooves. So score one for the hot press paper, but here's where the real challenge is, in the watercolors. Now I did do a test on this paper before I did the dragon and centaur and I was happy with the results, but I think all of the erasing during the pencil phase of the dragon and centaur painting ruined the paper a bit. The erasers may have made the paper a little extra oily or something, I don't know, but I just didn't like how the watercolors sat. They're working okay I guess for this one, I was mindful not to erase too much, and it's not great, but it's not horrible. What do you think? Now I'm gonna try the cold press paper. Both are made from the same brand, Arches, which is French, and both are really, really good and pretty expensive paper, but the difference is really just the texture. Do I put more emphasis on the ink lines, which looks better on the hot press, or the watercolors, which looks better on the cold press? My gut is telling me to go with the hot press for two reasons. One, I like giving you a coloring page and therefore want the best inked page possible. And two, I'm not painting big areas of watercolors on this piece. There's no large space for the watercolors to really shine. So if you can't really see the difference in how the watercolor sits, why sacrifice the smooth line work? Oh, and this reference came in a free sample pack that I downloaded. Free is always good. So the ink lines were really rough. They feel almost chalky, but that was really expected. The watercolors are sitting so nice though, but I think the chalky lines are gonna be the deciding factor for me. Looking at them side by side, the ink lines are just more confident and clean on the hot press. Can you see it? Here, I scan them in so you can see better. This is the hot press. See how clean the lines are? And here's the cold press. See how the texture affected the ink lines? Maybe you can see it, maybe not, but I can. And a lot of what makes art, art is a feeling. So I'm gonna use the hot press paper and just try to keep the erasing to a minimum. And to do that, I need to do a lot of planning. So next time you see me, we'll work on the layout of the piece. Check back here in a few days for more and thanks for following along with my new painting, The Guild. I did it! I've decided what paper I'm going to use for my new painting, The Guild. It's this one, the hot press watercolor paper. Now I just need to clean my art table off so I can get ready to begin the work. The paper comes in 22 by 30 inch sheets and my dragon and centaur painting was 11 by 30 inches. So I cut the sheet in half. Get it? Because 11 is half of 22. Sorry, if I have to do math, you do too. I think I'll be painting the guild at 15 by 30 inches though. Getting a good measurement on this paper is a little bit difficult because the edges are frayed. I get it, it's artsy, it's French, it looks nice, but it's hard to measure when there's no straight cut edges. There is this very subtle line here, so I'm gonna use that for now. Thanks a lot, Frenchies. Okay, so line the 15 up to this nearly imperceptible line here and then mark it there. Then do the same on the other side. The line is here, I guess, and then mark it over here. Now I just connect the two marks and we have a line to cut. 
I'm gonna lay my cutting mat out underneath. It's not really big enough for me to cut all in one try, so I'll have to do it in pieces. A cutting mat is essential for any time you're gonna use an X-Acto knife. You don't wanna ruin your art table with cuts, and trust me, you'll feel the cut marks through your paper if you don't use a cutting mat. And here's a tip I learned in art school. Don't try to cut in one swipe. Take your time and run your X-Acto blade over and over until the paper is cut, especially when you're cutting 600 GSM paper like this. Just take your time. Okay, I think this is, yeah, that part is done. Now just to, now I just need to turn it over and hopefully it lines up. Obviously, X-Acto blades are sharp. If you're a kid, get adult supervision. And if you're an adult, keep your fingers away from the edges. Yikes. So I think this took about 10 passes each side to finally cut all the way through. I'm not pushing hard. I'm just firmly pressing and letting the blade do its work. And I think we are done. Look at that. And before you start worrying about whether you're good enough to do this or perfection or whatever, look, I messed up. The blade went off on its own over here. And it happens. I'm not gonna get upset about it. I'm just going to, well, ignore it for now. That's tomorrow Scott's problem. But seriously, let your lines be wonky. Let your cuts be wonky. Let your art be wonky. It's what makes it human. It's what makes it art. Don't sweat the little things. Stop looking for perfection. So now I'm just adding a little border for the tape area so my tape lines are straight. I think this is half inch. And now we're ready to tape it to my artboard. I got these at Michael's, I think, years ago. They're just like really light pieces of wood with metal on two sides. I don't know why there's metal there. I like taping my art to these because I can move the piece if I need to work on something else. I used to tape my paper to the table, but then if I had to use my table for anything, I was kind of stuck. So these boards are good to have, just in case. And yes, despite forsaking me in my viral short about taping down your art, I still use the $12 a roll tape from Plaza Art. It's still the best tape. Just don't make a video about it and you'll be fine, I think. Okay, paper is ready to go. And as I mentioned in yesterday's video, I am not making the same mistake I did with the dragon and centaur where I worked out the composition and the posing and everything on the paper. I think it wore the paper down a little bit too much for me to paint on it. So I've purchased a bunch of great reference poses and I'm gonna bring them into Photoshop and figure out my composition digitally, you know, like an adult or something. So I'm just gonna drop them in and then remove the background using the select subject tool. Slide it over and grab the next one until I have them all in and wow, that's, that's crowded. Okay, last one and then I'll spread them out. You know what? This is just chaos. I'm gonna open a new page and just drag them in one by one. Yeah, that's, that's a lot better. Wow, I think future Scott is gonna be so mad when he sees how many characters I've made him draw. Or he may thank me for it, who knows? Future Scott is so unpredictable. And this is it, I think. Remember, this is just for posing, costume, and general proportion reference. There'll be dwarves and elves and halflings and all sorts of races and creatures. It should be fun. What I need to do now is figure out the best way to transfer this onto paper. Since the paper is so thick, I can't use a light box. So I guess it's time to break out the projector. You can use any cheap projector that will hook up to your phone. I use this when I have to project an image onto my paper to trace. It's great for big projects. This one is made by a company called Vonkyo, and this one was the Vonkyo Burger. I don't think they make this anymore. It just hooks right up to your phone using the Wi-Fi, and it's just a screen sharing setup. Okay, now I've got it set up, and I've blocked out the light. This is perfect. Except for one thing, I can't move the projector far enough away to get the whole image onto the paper. I'll just cut the image in half and that should work. Perfect. Now I'm just gonna mark the general shapes of each character onto the paper very lightly so I have my layout. And while I do this, I want to again remind you that using photo reference, tracing, using a ruler, these are tools to help you make art. They don't make you any less of an artist. In fact, it makes you a better artist. If I didn't use Photoshop or photo reference or the projector, I'd easily spend an additional two to five hours drawing and redrawing the characters until I got them perfectly laid out the way I wanted to. Does using these tools in any way make me less of an artist? Absolutely not. Don't let simple-minded people tell you that tracing or using reference is cheating, my friend. There's a lot of art to be done on this. I have 37 characters to pencil, ink, and paint, and I think I'm gonna have an absolute blast doing it. I hope seeing the entire process from concept to finish is either helpful or entertaining, or maybe even both. I truly love doing these larger pieces, and I'm happy to bring you along for the ride. There's gonna be a lot of interesting characters, so I hope some of them might be familiar to you. Maybe one of your OCs you drew up, or a character you created during an RPG event. Either way, I hope when this is all done, we can add backstories to each one together, if you're up for that kind of adventure. 
It's time to start drawing them. 37 characters, 37 members of the guild. I've got my photo reference all laid out and I've projected the image onto my paper and I'm doing this. I'm really doing it. Okay, deep breaths. It's just, it's just paper and pencil. Nothing to be scared of. Right now, I'm just copying what I see from my photo reference, just getting the clothing and the folds and anything else I can use from it. So this first character, I'm gonna be doing a Dragonborn. They're apparently a race of dragon-like humanoids and they just sounded like a lot of fun to draw, so I'm drawing them. My gut reaction was to not draw the dragon head straight on because it might look weird. And of course, my gut was right. That just looked weird. Kind of looked like someone was wearing a dragon helmet or something. Okay, let's try having them look to our right so you can see the shape a bit more. You know, after doing the dragon and centaur painting, I swore I would take a break from drawing dragons and literally the first character I do is, okay, this that's not bad, right? I like it. This next character, I'm not sure what they're gonna be. Human, elf, half elf, I don't know. I just like the pose, which reminds me, a lot of the characters are sitting down. I need to create chairs for them or stools or something. You can see how small these faces are. It's really hard to get in any kind of detail, but I'll figure it out, I guess. I want the guild to represent the incredibly diverse characters you would find in books or RPG games or your imagination. So I got some help from my friend Charlotte, who was so incredibly kind to spend time on the phone with me and answer a ton of questions about races and classes and who's taller than who. And well, you're the best, Charlotte. Thank you. And it was at this moment that I realized, what if she was in a wheelchair? Can you have wheelchairs in fantasy? I think so. I mean, you can have a half dragon, half human. Why not a wheelchair? You know what? I'm doing it. I'm gonna design a fantasy wheelchair. We've got the wheel here, I guess, and some sort of design in the middle. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm making this up as I go. She can have a book over here, like a spell book or something. And the armrest can be all curved and artsy, I think. And the rest of the chair can be wooden and curved and what do I do for the front wheel? I don't want it to look like a shopping cart wheel. Okay, I'm just gonna step away for a bit. Just draw another character. This one could be a human paladin, maybe? What do you think? Now, you know what? I drew them too big. Ugh, I've gotta start over. Sometimes, even with the traced guidelines, you can find a way to still mess it up, right? So a lot of you have asked me what inspired me to do this. And I think some of you are asking out of general curiosity of where my inspiration comes from. And some of you are just wondering what kind of crazy I am to draw 37 characters all lined up like they're posing for a photo. And to the first group, I was inspired by the photo references I found when I was working on the dragon and centaur sketches. I just wanted to paint them. And for those of you wondering what kind of crazy I am, it's this kind, this kind of crazy. Okay, let's start inking. The Dragonborn is a fun looking character, but there's not much space for details. Their head is the size of a quarter, so I have to be creative in what details go in and which ones get tossed. As I'm inking, I'm kind of making gut decisions to edit out what's important and what's not. It's at this moment where I have the idea to have the Dragonborn rest their hand on the wheelchair. It's right there and could be a friendly gesture, but I'm worried that it may look like he's pushing the wheelchair and that might be considered condescending. I'm doing this live and some of the comments are that maybe they should have their hand on her arm. I try that, but it doesn't sit well with me. I eventually decide that a resting hand on the chair can look casual. I hope it does. I don't know if this seems silly or not, but when an artist makes an image like this, you really need to consider who you're drawing. What's their relationship with the people around them? What's the circumstances? These are things that matter. I want the Dragonborn and the woman to be friendly, at least friendly enough to where the Dragonborn feels comfortable enough to rest their hand on the back of the chair and the woman feels comfortable enough to allow it. The way she's sitting though, seems like she's pulling away from him. So I decide to move her hand in a bit to make her look a little more confident. Look, you wanted to know what goes into these things. Well, it's this. This is what I think about when I'm drawing. So I like the little book holder on the side. It's, it's really kind of cute but the wheels and the chair overall, I didn't put any planning into this and it shows. I try my best to make it work, but it just doesn't really look good. When the live is over, I grab a piece of tracing paper and I just copy the wheelchair so I can have the proportions. I transfer the drawing onto another sheet of watercolor paper and this time using an ellipse tool, I take my time and I figure out something that's pleasing to me. Something that my mage here would be proud to own. I add some kind of tread to make the travel on dirt roads possible. And then, here's the tricky part, I need to cut it out because I'm going to be pasting this over the existing inked drawing. Why am I doing this? Because I'm going to be painting this with watercolors. And if I were to add any paint over such a large area, the watercolors just wouldn't sit well on it. So now I have a nice clean piece of watercolor paper that I can paint on. Okay, let's put this right here and 
that that doesn't look too bad what do you think Okay, now to glue it on. And here's where I'm gonna tell you, I have no idea what kind of glue is best to work for watercolor paper. Is this thing even still good? This should, this should be okay, right? I mean, we use this in elementary school with construction paper. Why not on $18 sheet French watercolor paper? Paper's paper, I, I hope. I think that'll hold. Okay, so I'm just gonna grab my pen and just clean up the edges a little bit and we're good. Now I'm just doing the same thing for the armrest. I'm gonna add some cushioning and fix the overall shape here. And that looks horrible. I, I don't like it at all. Okay, I didn't wanna to have to do this, but we're breaking out the acrylic gouache. So why acrylic gouache? Because regular gouache is water activated, meaning as soon as I try to go over it with watercolors, the white gouache paint would lift up and blend with the watercolors. I'd also lose any inking I would put down on the white gouache too. But acrylic gouache dries like acrylics. Once it's dry, you can't reactivate it with water, meaning I can paint over it. The only problem is watercolor can't soak into acrylic gouache like it does with watercolor paper. So it will just kind of sit on top of it. That's why I cut out the wheel. It was a large area and it just would have looked weird, but my hope is the armrest will be too small for anyone to notice the offset of colors. This is what it looks like to work with traditional mediums. You learn to fix mistakes. There's no undo button, my friends. And this is also why it's so important for you to make mistakes. A lot. I'm able to work on pieces this large and know confidently that whatever happens, I know how to fix it. That confidence comes from four decades of epic failures, absolute disasters, and so many late nights trying to find something, anything that I can do to recover from them. Those failures and all of the trial and error in trying to fix them led me to here. And if these don't work, I can always repaint it or even repaint a section of this and insert it in Photoshop. There's no mistake so serious that you can't redo it or fix it, I promise. And if you make a mistake that you don't know how to fix, Experiment, try everything, cut out a new piece and glue it on, whatever works. But please don't be afraid to fail with your art. It's how we learn. And more importantly, it's all a part of this glorious experience we call being human. It's day four of working on my guild painting, and a lot of you gave me some really wonderful suggestions for members of the guild. And for that, I want to thank you. I want the guild to reflect the wonderfully diverse creatures and classes that exist in fantasy books and games and stuff. So this fine fellow over here, I think is going to be a hobgoblin. So they'll probably have like red skin or something, but I also wanted to give them some personality. So they have an, a nose ring and a couple earrings and you can see the photo reference I started with. I really like the costume, but it's up to me to kind of figure out who the character in the costume is. And that honestly is probably one of the funnest things about doing things like this. And you don't have to use everything you see in your photo reference. For instance, I'm not sold on the hat. So what if I gave our little hobgoblin some wild hair like this? Okay, no, no, that's, that's a little too wild. Oh, and I, I ruined the paper. See that? There's like a little divot in the paper now. I'll let future Scott deal with that. So I'm just gonna add some messy, big bushy hair for our little hobgoblin. And I think that works. I think that'll be pretty good. This next character, I think though, I'm gonna use the photo reference exactly as it is because it's pretty much perfect for what I want. I'm thinking they're gonna be like a human paladin, maybe, I love the armor. Again, I want your suggestions and also I think when this is all done, I'd like for us to come up with stories and names and backgrounds for these characters, you know, together. Okay, so now I'm gonna do the chainmail around his neck area and just so you know, I've never drawn chainmail before, or at least I don't remember doing it. I'm just kind of figuring it out as I go. I'm making little circles. I'm looking at the photo reference and, you know, chainmail is just little circles of metal just kind of uh, linked together. So I'm just kind of making a an approximation of what I think that would look like with my ink lines. I'm saying this because a lot of you will say, I can't draw this or I can't draw that. and. A lot of that is because you just haven't tried yet. I've found that the best way of learning how to draw something is to just draw it. I mean, obviously looking at that thing that you want to draw, that's how you learn how to draw that thing. Say you don't know how to draw a tree. You look at a tree and you draw it. You look at it, really observe it. What is it about it that makes it a tree? And then you start drawing that. That's what you're seeing me do. Most of the time, I've never drawn something that you're seeing me draw before. I, I've never, I, I don't draw armor. And I'm just looking at a photo and it's not gonna be perfect. That's the other thing, is you think that it's gotta look exactly like the thing. It doesn't. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. I just, 
a lot of you keep saying, I can't draw this and I can't draw that. And all I'm saying is find a photo of that thing or go outside and find that thing and just practice it. It's, it's just a matter of just stop giving yourself limitations and draw. Okay, so this photo reference was this guy here. Pretty intense. Gotta love the commitment. 10 out of 10, my friend. But I've had quite a few people ask me to draw a Therian. And a Therian, as I've learned, is someone who's born with the spirit of an animal. In the guild, Therians would have the ability to shift into their animal form, much like a werewolf or a lichen. Therians aren't just wolves, of course, but for this character, I chose a wolf form. Okay, I don't like their weapon placement here. Let's try angling it this way and making them hold it with both hands. Hmm, no, how about a shield? Yeah, that may work. I hope my Therian friends are happy with this representation. And for those of you wondering, how do you draw the fur on a Therian or werewolf or wolf? The answer is, I don't know. There's no classes you take in college on it. You just find reference and you draw what you see. That's all I'm doing here. Don't be afraid to draw things you've never drawn before. It's actually kind of fun to learn. I know that some of you just like to draw the same thing over and over again, and that is perfectly okay to do that. If it makes you happy, please keep doing it. But if you are afraid to draw other things and that fear is keeping you from making art, then I hope watching me try to draw new things every day is helping somehow. I hope seeing me make mistakes erase a lot, trace, use photo reference, erase a whole lot more, rip up my art, let my art be wonky. I hope seeing that I'm human too helps. I guess this is another human character. It doesn't have to be, but for now, we'll call them human. So there's definitely not enough Asian representation in fantasy, so I'm happy to add that. But also, I've been asked to show a trans mask character, and I genuinely don't know how I would do that visually. So. Would it be appropriate to say that this character is trans mask as well? Please let me know. And while we're on the subject, if seeing other races or identities or religions or even genders that you don't identify with bothers you, please seek help. Find counseling. We're all human, my friends. Except for the Therians, I suppose, so I won't speak for them. But seriously, if you've been following my channel for any amount of time and you're still fearful of people who don't look like you, pray like you, or love like you, then I don't think you're really following my channel. Everyone deserves love and dignity and the ability to be themselves. And I hope my art represents a world where everyone is proud of who they are and loved for it. Thank you for following along. And up next, elves, dwarves, and uh, Saracen? I think I got that right. Leave me a comment on who else should be in the guild. It's day five of working on my new painting that I'm calling the guild. And the photo reference that I'm using for this person, while the costume is kind of boring, the model has such a fun otherworldly look to them. They really do kind of look elvish. Can you see that? It's really kind of cool. Well, I thought it was cool. I haven't worked out who they are or what they do, but I did decide that they were gonna have a nice staff, like a Gandalf type of staff. And you can't have elves without dwarves. I love dwarves, they're just so fun. And for this one, I used this photo reference. And you can see, obviously, the proportions were not what I needed, but that's what an imagination is for. Remember friends, you can use as much or as little of a reference as you choose. It's totally up to you, and there is no right or wrong way when it comes to using photo reference. I will say that if you plan on copying a photo exactly, and you plan on selling your art, Either buy reference like I did here, use free stock reference, there's some links on my website, pose for your own reference, or get permission from the photographer. But again, that's only if you plan on copying a photo exactly and making money off of it. You can copy a photo exactly all day long as much as you want to for practice and your portfolio and you don't need anybody's permission for that. But if you're posting it online, it's always just good etiquette to credit the photographer or model or wherever the source came from. So as I'm doing this piece, I'm thinking, I think he should have a backpack. And so I just decided to add a little backpack because they're adventurers. They, they need to carry stuff, you know, for picnics. And I think that's probably the funnest thing about doing these is coming up with little backstories or little logical things that characters would need in a fantasy world like this. And for some reason, I decided that our dwarf friend here needed spikes on his boots. 
I, I don't know why. And it looks hideous because it was an afterthought and I'm definitely gonna go in and fix it later. So in my last video, I mentioned a Saracen and that's just a term I always remembered for warriors from the Middle East in like history books and stuff. I checked and it doesn't seem to be a derogatory term, just not used anymore. But I bought some photos of someone in this costume because it reminded me of a Saracen and the fantasy world absolutely could use some more Middle Eastern representation. But what I really like most about this is the character is really gender neutral or fluid, meaning they could be male or female depending on what the audience perceives them to be. I know a lot of my Muslim friends have asked for a hijabi character and I hope this fits the bill. Also, one thing that is absolutely making me so happy about this piece overall is the textures and the patterns. I love that each character has their own unique style and the different textures of clothing and armor and hair and fur. It's just so, so fun and it makes me happy. I'm, I'm happy. Okay, so the last character for today is going to be a goblin. And from everything I've read about goblins is they're generally ugly green with a big bulbous head and large eyes and really big ears like this or this. But I wanted to create a goblin that was a valuable part of the guild, someone nice that they could count on, preferably a female. But when I looked up what female goblins would look like, I saw mostly images like this or this or this. So I just kind of made my best guess at what a young female goblin adventurer would look like. Giving her the big head and big eyes and ears that a goblin would have and putting it on this photo reference that I had already picked out. And I think she came out pretty goblin-y, but I'm not sure about the eyes. They feel too cartoony for me. I try cleaning it up a little bit. I add freckles, which I think improves it, but in the end it just was bothering me too much. So I broke out the acrylic wash. And I know this is gonna cause me problems later on when I put on the watercolors, but since I'm scanning this in so you all could color in with me, I'm gonna fix it with the acrylic wash. This is now the second big fix that I've had to do in only the first eight characters, I think. So remember that my friends, when you worry about messing up, it's a part of making art, we mess up. We learn to either fix it or move past it. It's not the end of the world. Don't overthink it and stop trying to make your art perfect. There's no such thing as perfect art and it's absolutely foolish to even want perfect art. Let your art be wonky, like a goblin's head. Anyways, I think this is looking a little better. It seems to fit a little more with the guild characters and hopefully I've represented female goblins everywhere in a good light. And while I've got the acrylic wash out, I might as well fix those dwarf boots I wanted to fix. I hope you're enjoying following along with the guild and also these longer form videos. Stay tuned for more characters like an Air Genasi, I think that's like a genie or something, a half elf, half human, a tabaxi, God, I hope I'm saying these right, that's like a cat person, and a cobalt. It's day six of working on my new painting that I call The Guild. And I'm really enjoying this painting, like really enjoying it. And I wanted to thank you all for your encouragement and support as I paint something for me because it makes me happy. Thank you. So the photo reference I was using for this character back here was this one. And I think it just felt too human. So I started messing around with the hair and I thought, what if they were like an elemental or something and their hair was weightless? I know, I know, you're thinking, you're just giving yourself an excuse to draw floaty hair, Scott. And yes, true, absolutely. But it works, right? I mean, it it fits, I think. And I looked it up and there's something called an air genasi. They're like air genies or something. So floaty hair can be a thing, right? At least in my fantasy world, okay? This next character was originally my centaur for the dragon and centaur painting, but I wound up changing it and I always liked the reference, so here we go. I think they're gonna be a half elf, but I don't know what kind of class. Also, while I was really disappointed that I didn't get to use this reference for my centaur, I knew I was gonna draw this character one day. Sometimes your photo reference doesn't work for your piece, and it's better to discard the reference rather than force it and regret it later. I loved everything about this photo, the angle of the head, the lighting, the hair, it just looked really fun to draw, and it was. For me, that's where inspiration comes from, something I observe. So many of you are looking for inspiration to come from your mind, and it absolutely can, but there are so many ways that you can be inspired to make art 
don't assume that art can only come from your imagination. It can come from a photo like this, or a book you read, or a song, or a place you visit, or just a funny story you heard, or a feeling, or something you found online, even AI generated. Inspiration is inspiration, my friend, regardless of where it comes from. And art is no less or more art based on where the inspiration came from. For me, this photo inspired the centaur painting, even though I didn't really use it fully. And now it's inspiring this half-elf character in the guild. Okay, now it's time to draw a tabaxi. That's a cat person. And this is the photo reference for the pose and the costume. I love drawing anthropomorphic characters. I've always loved it. And please remember, I grew up on Bugs Bunny and Thundercats and NeverEnding Story and the Chronicles of Narnia. And I could go on and on about my love for characters that are walking, talking animals. I just think it's so cool. You know what? I don't like the angle of this head. I'm gonna try something a little bit more to the right. And since this character's in front, I'm gonna draw them out too. You know what? I'm gonna make them a kobold, which is kind of like a little lizard dragon-ish kind of little creature. Yeah, that'll be fun. And while I'm at it, I might as well finish up the half elf's arm and sword and just because she's in front of the tabaxi, let's get all of that out of the way. And finally, I get to the fun part, which is drawing this big, cat head. I'm going to go with kind of a snow leopard look and I think it makes them very dignified, doesn't it? And the robes should be really decorative, silky. They're very respectable, this tabaxi. I think so. And finally, we have our little cobalt. This is my photo reference, which is really a nice pose. I, I really like it and the armor and everything is great. So I'm probably going to use it pretty much identically as I see it in the photo, except for the whole cobalt head. And speaking of kobolds, apparently this is what they're supposed to look like. Unless you're the internet and you like to make things cute. And I just thought that they were so adorable, so my kobold is a little bit more cute than I think maybe they're supposed to be, but I love them. And for those of you wondering why I'm okay with a cute kobold, but not a sexy goblin, I, I just am, okay? Well, also, cute doesn't objectify them based on their sexuality, so there's that too. But the point I'm trying to make is, my decision in the design of my characters can be inspired by anything, even cute anime-ish drawings that I find online. Inspiration can come from anywhere, and as artists, we should welcome that. So that's my cute little kobold, and I'm very proud of where I got my inspiration for them. And I really love their little tail, though I guess it's not very little. It looks like it's pretty long, all things considered. But I had fun with it, and I hope you enjoyed watching me make them. Join me next time for a half-orc pirate, a gnome, and an autistic centaur. My personal favorite, I think. It's day seven of working on my fantasy painting that I call The Guild. And before I start working on the next characters, I just thought that maybe our tabaxi character needed some more definition in their fur. So I'm coming in with a pen with the finest point that I could find, which is the Micron .005. It's so tiny. Much better. Okay, so I love this adorable pirate outfit, and I thought I'd do some sort of half-orc or something that's a little bit smaller than normal. And I really think the funnest thing about doing fantasy characters is the scales that you can work with. You can have really tiny people like fairies, and you can have really large giants or dragons and whatnot. And I think that scale is just so fascinating and so fun to work with. And here we have another wee character who I think I'm gonna make a leprechaun. No, not a leprechaun, uh, a gnome. That's what it is. Um, this will be a gnome. I hope I didn't offend any leprechauns or gnomes. I just get you guys confused sometimes. And I thought this reference was really nice for our centaur. I really like the leather armor and I just thought that their expression was very peaceful. I just need to add a quiver of arrows and then I think I'll be done. Okay, on to inking our little half orc pirate. I'm not sure if they're a half orc though because they're really small and I think orcs are really big. So if they're half orc, what's the other half? Gnome? That's like half Great Dane, half Chihuahua, right? I don't think I wanna know how that happened. I, I just don't. I'm trying to give them more animal-like features though I'm not sure if I'm loving it just quite yet. The nose is kind of bothering me a little bit and I may go back and change it later on. But other than that, I like it. So our little gnome, not leprechaun character, I want them to be really happy. Like one of those extroverts that I tend to avoid whenever possible. 
like that kind of person. And I'm realizing now that the photo reference, the person was kind of on two different levels. They're sitting on one chair and their foot is on another and their other foot is on the ground. And I just can't get it right. So I'm just gonna erase the whole thing and start all over. There was no way to fix it the way it was. They would have been floating above the ground. So I'm drawing them lower and just going to redo the feet to be crisscross applesauce like that. And before I start inking, I might as well draw in another character, which is another Middle Eastern Saracen type of character. Okay, that works. And now back to our gnome. And from what I was able to research, I saw that gnomes like these hats that are kind of pointy. And so I kind of gave them a little pointy hat and just a little bit of flair to their costume. I don't exactly know what this gnome brings to the guild. Um, hopefully it's more than just a positive attitude and a sunny disposition. But I do know that I do not like their hands. So I'm gonna add a little bit of white acrylic wash over them and try to fix them as best as I can. I hate, I hate drawing hands. I'll never not, not hate drawing hands. And while I have the acrylic wash out, I I'm just don't like their nose. It just, it just didn't work. That'll do, pig, that'll do. So I hope you can see that I make mistakes a lot. I mean, you could see that, right? I know it's gonna happen. And I know that I can fix it because I've made so many mistakes throughout my life. All of my failures, all of my mistakes, all of those bad lines or horrible hands or ugly noses, those epic blunders gave me the experience of making a mistake, then trying to figure out how to fix it. And because I have that experience of making mistakes and trying different ways to correct them, I can now go into something like this large drawing without the panic of, what if I mess up? I know the answer to that panic question. If I mess up, I pull out the acrylic gouache and I fix it. Or I paint over it and fix it with the gouache later. Or I can draw it on another piece of paper and glue that paper onto the painting. Or I can fix it in Photoshop. And I know this because I've tried all of these and more. I have a mental safety net that keeps me from panicking. All because I've made these mistakes so many times in the past, they don't frighten me anymore because I've learned how to fix them. So our centaur, I mentioned in the last video that they were autistic. And this idea came to me from a comment where someone suggested ways of representing autism visually. And one of their suggestions was ear defenders, which I assumed was like a fantasy version of noise canceling headphones. And I loved the idea. So our little centaur here has magical ear defenders that protect them from overstimulation. And I'm so happy that I get to not only draw my favorite fantasy character, a centaur, but also have them be autistic, like me. And if anyone out there has magical ear defenders that they'd be willing to barter for, meet me at the tavern tomorrow at noon. No, wait, too noisy. Meet me by the lake outside of the city, much quieter. We'll talk. And that's where we are now. A half orc, half, I don't know what, pirate, an extroverted gnome, another Middle Eastern character we need to find a story for, and an autistic centaur with magical ear defenders. Next up, we have a halfling, a kender, a changeling, a goliath, and a drow bard. It's day eight of working on my fantasy painting that I'm calling The Guild. And today we're gonna to be doing some littler folks, you know, we people, with the first one being a kender. Now, I had no idea what a kender was, but I had this photo reference and the model seemed to be really enjoying herself. And I originally drew her as I saw in the reference, until I read about kenders. Apparently, kenders are most known for their curiosity, fearlessness, and ability to always find trouble. Essentially, they're troublemakers and kleptomaniacs. They'll steal anything. So I changed their right arm to be pickpocketing the person in front of them because that seemed like exactly what a kender would do, right? And I'm not thrilled with their eyes. I think I'll try to fix it later so that they're looking down a bit. These are so small, it's so hard to get the detail that I want, but I'm gonna be kind to myself and just keep moving forward. This next one, I've not decided who they are or what they are. I am absolutely open to ideas and suggestions. I just really like the pose and I love drawing big draping folds almost as much as I love drawing long hair. So that's why I added this character. And for me, I can always tell when I'm copying a photo exactly like this one compared to when I go off script like the Kender or the Gnome. First telltale sign is all of the mistakes and erasing. And secondly, there's just less confidence in my line work. 
I'm guessing a lot. And that lack of confidence, I think, is so evident. It's so obvious. Not that it'll ever stop me from drawing out of my head when I need to, but I can see the insecurity in my line work when I do it, and that always makes me a bit more self-conscious. But in the case of this character, I found a photo that I really liked, and I pretty much copied it identically, and I could see how much more confident I am with this character than I am with the Kender or the Gnome. And it's just easier for me to copy a photograph. It's just something I've always been really good at. And while I'm trying to push myself away from that, I can just naturally see how much more confident I am when I do it. And I like my art more when I'm using photo reference than when I'm not. And I'm mentioning this now because I do get asked a lot about, is it bad to use photo reference or rely on using photo reference? And my entire career has been relying on photo reference. And there have been artists throughout history who rely on models and reference. That's just how our brains work. And while I'm always quick to tell them, no, there's nothing wrong with it, there is still that self-conscious feeling that we get as artists to say, why can't we draw out of our heads as good as we can when we have reference? And I think that's just how we're built. It doesn't make us any less artists, it just means that our art is better when we use reference. Anyways, I just wanted you all to know that I get self-conscious about that too. You're not alone and it's just part of being human and an artist. Okay, so the minute that I saw this photo reference, I knew this person was definitely a halfling or a hobbit. And I just, it, was just, it screamed hobbit. I wanted to have the characters interacting a bit more. I felt that other than the dragonborn resting their hand on the mage's wheelchair, there really wasn't much interaction between the characters. And that's hard to do when your photo reference is compiled from various unrelated sources. So with the Kender pickpocketing the one character in front of them and this halfling drinking with the other character with the keg, I hope I'm making it feel more natural. And for some reason, my apologies, I recorded this part so up close that I didn't get to capture me drawing their legs. But I did record myself adding hair to their legs and feet, so I got that. Okay, so back to them interacting. If you look at the photo reference, her left hand is kind of balled up in a fist, like an excited fist. And I thought, what if she had her hand on the other character, like, you know, oh, stop it, that kind of thing. Oh, you're so funny. Just inter interacting. Not, not grabbing inappropriately, I promise. So this photo reference is from the same pirate session that I used for the little half orc character from yesterday. And I thought I would make this person a changeling. And from what I understand, a changeling can change into any kind of animal, which is something I absolutely love. My original character when I was a kid was Orion the Barbarian, he could turn into any animal, and when I played WoW, I played a druid because I love the whole concept of turning into an animal. I think that's just cool. And so I gave them a little bit of animalistic features, um, you know, whether it be the broader nose, like a kind of like a cat's nose or eyes, and even just a little bit longer fingernails. And I don't know about you, but I just imagine that the halfling and the changeling are like the best of friends. And that makes me, that makes me happy. And that's the kind of stuff that you want with a piece of art like this. I, I want there to be that friendliness, that familiarity. Um, just, I want the characters to interact a little bit more. But because of how I do my work, because I reference a lot of things, and because I'm not taking the photo reference myself, and also because I don't plan this stuff out as much as I really should, um, I don't get that kind of closeness, that kind of uh, personal touch sometimes. And I'm getting better. I, I plan this out a lot more than I ever would before. And as I get older, I'm going to hopefully have a little more patience and I will start planning my pieces a bit better. But for now, I'm happy with even just this little moment, even just these two little characters. I'm happy with their interaction and that's enough for me. Oh, and I promised you a Goliath and a Drow Bard, but we've already done four characters here, so they will be in the next one along with a Kenku, which is like a half person, half crow, and a non-binary tiefling. It's day nine of working on my fantasy painting that I'm calling The Guild. 
And this first character I'm drawing is a drow. That's spelled D-R-O-W. I thought it was dro like crow, but I was told it's drow like cow. And from what I've read, drow, like cow, are dark elves with purplish skin and white hair. They've traditionally been portrayed as generally evil and connected to the evil spider goddess Lolf. That's L-O-L, like laugh out loud, with a th at the end. Lolf. Look, I'm just learning all of this with you. I'm, I'm trying here. Lolf. Maybe it's just me, but I thought that if there was a purplish skin, white haired, evil spider Lolf worshiping group of elves, they should probably be a bard. Now this was the photo reference that I used for this, so it's pretty close to it. They had a crossbow and I just swapped it out for the ukulele thingy. And I love that they have a headband. It, it kind of gives them a heavy metal kind of feel to it, which, which I love. Metal. Oh, and in the last video, I said that the gal with the keg was a changeling because they could change into animals. But I was corrected and told that apparently a changeling can change into other people and a shifter changes into animals. So thank you to everyone who corrected me on that. She's a shifter, not a changeling. And also, I know that that's not a ukulele. I, I, I found a photo of a bard's musical instrument and I just <laughs> I forgot what it was called, but it's... A ukulele just sounds funnier. This photo reference just screamed like giant or giantess to me. And so I found that there were a race of characters called Goliaths that I think are maybe around seven or eight feet tall. And so that kind of fit the bill and I was really excited to, to do this one. And this same model shows up probably four or five times in this piece. I There, there are some models who just have a presence. They've got just the way that they stand, the way that they look, um, and sometimes it's just the costumes too, but there's just something about this particular model that I really like drawing. And while the photo reference, she had a very bold, um, serious look, I think I lightened it up a little bit so that way our Goliath or our giant or half giant or whatever she's going to be feels a little bit softer and a little bit nicer. So you may notice that I go between two different pens uh, throughout the piece. And my favorite, of course, is the zebra brush pen. That's the purplish one that I can go both thick and thin lines with just the, the amount of pressure that I put on it. But for the really fine detail, I'm going to a 005 micron pen. It's literally the smallest tip pen that I could find, and it's also waterproof. And I think having the finer tip pen used for the little details like the patterns in the clothing or the fur gives us a sense of what's important and what's not. Like if I was to do the fur with the same line weight as I do with the zebra brush pen, it wouldn't look the same. It would be like everything has the same importance. And so having that smaller tip lets you as the viewer know that this isn't something that you need to focus all of your attention on. This little character here, I didn't know what they were gonna be. I just liked the pose. And then someone mentioned a Kenku, which is like a half crow or raven, half person. Oh, but wait, look at these. These are much cuter. So let's just erase the head here and get some photo reference for a crow or a raven. As I was looking for photo reference, I actually came across someone's cosplay of a Kenku and it was so good that I actually got some inspiration from that as well. I swear cosplayers are just amazing. Now, I didn't learn much about Kenkus because I kind of got caught up with just how cool they looked. So that's definitely something that we can talk about uh, when we come up with their profession and what they do which is, I guess, what a profession is. But I'm kind of getting stabby vibes from this Kenku. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's the, the knife or dagger that they're holding onto um, in one hand while they're drinking with another. But um, I don't know, maybe a thief or assassin type of uh, person. But I definitely feel like stabbing is part of their job requirement. And, and I know to a lot of you, you would love that profession where stabbing is a part of the, the job. Um, to those of you, I would say, please seek help. But um, I, I definitely think that a Kenku, a stabby Kenku is something that a lot of you would probably want to play. And, uh, 
and I commend you for that. Okay, and now for our final character for today, which is a non-binary tiefling. And I didn't know what a tiefling was until uh, my friend Charlotte told me to watch the Dungeons and Dragons movie. And um, I thought the tiefling was absolutely adorable. But the photo reference I'm using for this, if you remember, I used for my test. This one here, where I was just testing to see which kind of paper I wanted to use. But there was something so envy about it, something so androgynous about it that I thought, why not just have this character be non-binary? And that's kind of how I think these things need to happen organically, where maybe the photo reference or the character or something kind of pushes you towards how that character identifies themselves. And I hope that makes it feel more natural where it's not forced. And that's the other thing I wanna talk about just real quick is a lot of people feel that uh, having a diverse group of characters in a painting like this is forced or it's um, some sort of uh, political correctness or I think there's a term called virtue signaling or something like that. And I can't speak for other artists, of course, but at least for me, I want my fantasy worlds to be as diverse and as beautiful as the real world. Not for someone else's approval, but because that's the kind of world that I want to live in. But I'm also the kind of person who would like to live at a Ren fair too, so maybe I'm not the best person to ask. I just personally love having an autistic centaur or a mage in a wheelchair or a non-binary tiefling. I just think that it's cool for me. And that's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm doing this whole painting series is for me. And that makes me happy. So thank you guys for following along and thank you for all of the suggestions and the encouragement and corrections like the difference between a changeling and a shifter or a dro like crow or a drow like cow. It's day 10 of working on my fantasy painting that I'm calling The Guild. There's only eight more characters to go, I think. So that means I've drawn about 30 so far. Wow. Today I'm drawing an orc and I didn't want to do your stereotypical World of Warcraft orc that's basically a walking tank with tusks. I thought I'd do a nice orc cleric or something. An orc of character and good temperament, if you will. And I think that's been kind of the theme for this whole guild painting was that I didn't want to do everything that was your stereotypical fantasy character. I'm trying to find a humanity to them. I'm trying to find some diversity to them. And, um, and I'm having fun doing it. The problem I was having with this particular orc character was the more I was drawing them, the more I got into the inking and adding the details and everything, the more it looked very, very familiar. And I couldn't figure out why this character looked so familiar to me until I realized. It's me. Hi. I'm the problem. It's me. Oh, okay, that's, that's a little disconcerting, but hey, it happens. Sometimes you accidentally draw yourself as a kindly orc cleric. But w what if he had maybe a ponytail or something? You know, just something that was very unscott like a big giant genie-like ponytail. No, I don't like it. Let's just move on to the next character. I really like this photo reference and they just seemed very quiet, if that makes sense. Like they didn't speak up much during the adventures and they just kind of kept to themselves. And that is the kind of diversity that I like in something like this. That's the kind of diversity that we see in real life. Not everybody's volume dial goes to 11. That's a Spinal Tap reference for those of you under 40. And I think a natural group dynamic is there are gonna be those who are loud, those who are gonna be the ones getting all of the attention and those who are maybe in their own head. Uh, they're, they're there for a purpose, they're thinking about something else, they are just not as vocal as other people are. And this character is interesting to me. What are they thinking about? Um, what, what have they gone through? What's their purpose? What's their motivation, so to speak? I think by the ears, they're either an elf or a half elf, but um, definitely some sort of warrior. Let's find a story for them. I think this character would have a very interesting story and I want to know more. So this next character is going to be another dwarf, a female dwarf. And I was asked, I have been asked to do various body styles, various body types and shapes. And I feel like I've not been using the stereotypical athletic build in, in a lot of these, but 
I went a little bit more towards the, we'll say, rotund uh, shape for this dwarf, and I hope that makes the guild feel more natural. And here's the photo reference that I used. You can see, obviously, different body shape, but that's, again, what imaginations are for. Also, quite a few of my subscribers are from India, so this character will be of Indian descent. And of course, I read all of your requests and comments for different races or body types, religions, and identities. And I absolutely want to include every possible bit of representation that I can, but it does need to feel right. I never, ever want something to feel forced. If it feels right for the character, I'm totally doing it, but only if it feels right for the character. And I think as artists, we need to respect our art. We need to trust it. And artists, not every request is valid. We don't have to please anyone but ourselves. Please know that. Make art that makes you happy. Make art for you. And if at some point your art can make others happy, fantastic. If your art can represent those who hardly ever get representation, wonderful. But please, only after you've learned to make art for you first. There's so many people making so many requests of artists, so many demands of artists, what they should and shouldn't do, uh, what's good and what's not, what they're doing wrong. We need to set boundaries for ourselves. We need to make sure that we're making art that makes us happy first. And that could take years, decades. So just make sure that you're happy with yourself and your art first. Make sure that you're making art that makes you happy first. Be a little selfish. You don't owe the world anything. Then once you start to feel comfortable with your art and you feel like you can make an impact in the world, then you could start doing that. But please, please, artists, make sure you take care of yourself first. Okay, so here's the wonderful photo reference for this character. I'm pretty much gonna draw it exactly as I see it. But they're definitely giving off evil vibes, um, not stabby vibes like the Kenku, but this one, <laughs> this character is definitely evil. Maybe evil's not the right word. Um, dark, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what is it, a lawful evil or whatever? I, it's been, the last time I played Dungeons and Dragons was 1981. Uh, I was in junior high school, so I don't remember everything about it, but this person, this person definitely dark. And I kind of wanted to give them a bit of an undead or vampire type of vibe. So um, their nose is not fully formed. They're definitely some sort of magic user, some sort of mage, enchantress or whatnot. So I decided to give them some sort of electricity or, or magic kind of coming out of their fingers. And that's our four characters for today. With only four more to go tomorrow, I have an Aarakocra, I think that's what they're called, uh, the bird kind of person. I've got a Tortle, which is kind of like a tortoise kind of person. I've got an Artificer, who has a mechanical arm and a ton of mechanical tools on them. And Fawn or Satyr, you know, like a, like a Mr. Tumnus kind of person. So tune in tomorrow for that. Thanks again for following along. It's day 11 of working on my fantasy painting that I'm calling The Guild. This is it. This is the last four characters I'm drawing for this piece. I've done 30 so far, and these last four will make it 34 characters. How cool is that? And the photo reference for this character was actually this one right here. And there had been a few requests for a tortle, which is I guess like a half human, half tortoise type of character. And the furs on this model's back just kind of gave me shell vibes, so I kind of went with that. And I don't know anything about turtles, and honestly, from what I could see in my Google searching was that they don't generally have hair, but I really thought it would be funny to have this old turtle lady with long hair and things in her hair, and I just, I really kind of liked it. Like, she gives me kind of grandmothery kind of vibes. Like, she won't let any of the party members go on their adventure until they've had a good cup of soup or something. And I think the things in her hair are knitting needles, so she probably likes to make sweaters for everybody too when it gets cold. Okay, this next character, I don't know if they're human or not, but they are an artificer, which from what I've read means that they like to tinker. They're a tinkerer, uh, a mechanic, an engineer. And this is the photo reference that I had, and I drew them probably at about maybe three quarters of the height of a normal human, so they're a little smaller. I, again, I don't I haven't picked out what kind of race that they are. But I had fun creating a whole bunch of different gadgets and tools that they had on their belts and just basically pockets everywhere, even on their boots, I thought was kind of cool. 
To be honest, this is the kind of character that my son Logan would probably love. He's a mechanical engineer and he loves tinkering on stuff. And so for me, I thought this would be a character that he would love. I'm not thrilled with the mechanical arm. I was trying to keep it fantasy, but um, I also am missing digits. So I just, it's very rudimentary, but hopefully it, it, um, it works. Just a few more touches here and there, adding some pattern to their costume. And I think I'm gonna go and finish up the turtle character. I wasn't happy with their hand, so I thought I would add a second hand kind of resting on the hand that's currently on the cane. Which means, of course, adding some white to cover up the other hand so I can add in the newer hand. Again, constantly, constantly making mistakes, if you wanna call them that, or adjustments and having to use white to clean it up. You're not alone, my friends. We all do it. And finally, the Aarakocra. I hope I'm saying that right. They, they just seem like the coolest looking character. Um, I was really looking forward to this, mainly because I really want to do the wings. But um, I found a picture of a harpy eagle that I really liked for reference. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to enjoy this. Originally, I was going to use this photo reference for the body, but it just didn't seem to fit right. So I wound up using this one instead. Since you really don't see much of the body, I just wanted to get some sort of semblance of clothing and something colorful and light. I figure if this character flies, heavy armor might not be the best thing for them to wear. And I probably spent a little too much time on their head, but I was getting flashbacks of when I got to draw our school mascot in high school. We were the Oak Grove Eagles and I did the mascot head and this kind of reminded me of that. And for the wings, I referenced this Hawkman statue that I really liked. I liked the way that the wings framed Hawkman and I wanted to do the same for our Aarakocra. I also decided that I needed to differentiate between the inside wings and the ones that are closer to us. So I wound up adding more detail than I normally would put in, but I wound up adding some finer feather kind of texture to the inside wings and I think it really came out nice. Younger me would have never spent this much time on something like wings. I, I just didn't have the patience for it. And I don't know where my patience now suddenly has come from or maybe I'm just getting better at my time management because I'm not spending hours and hours in front of this piece working nonstop. I'm working 25, maybe 30 minutes at a time and then I walk away and I'm maybe only spending about an hour a day on this piece. So. Um, maybe my time management has gotten better. My patience hasn't improved. And finally, our fawn or satyr. I, I just actually looked it up, the difference between a fawn and a satyr. A satyr is mainly from Roman Greek mythology and not nice, not as nice as fawns. Uh, so I think this is definitely a fawn. And the photo reference had kind of more like deer antlers, but after looking at it for a bit, I think I wanted it to be more of a Mr. Tumnus kind of goat. Uh, horns. So I don't know if this counts as a second bard uh, because they're playing a, was that a pan flute I think? I, I'm sorry, I'm horrible with my musical instruments, but uh, I don't know if that counts as a second bard or if there's another profession that um, would do that. And I'm just thinking about this now, but after looking at some Mr. Tumnus photos, I might want to add some larger kind of goat ears to her. I think that might look really cute. And that's it. That's our little fawn bard, possibly, and the entire guild. I, I think we're done. No, wait, I want to add some cute little mice warriors in the bottom left corner. I found these adorable miniatures online and I just fell in love with them and I thought I've got to add these little mice characters into the guild. I reached out to the creators, but I haven't heard back. I definitely want to get permission. Otherwise, I'm going to have to change it a lot more than I'm currently. I'm making small little changes to them, but I think I would need to make a bit more changes to not kind of infringe on their copyright or anything. But it was just too cute not to not to add them in. I mean, come on, how could I not? They're just, they're absolutely adorable. Oh, and we decided during the live to add a piece of cheese on the shield of the one of them. So we thought it would be a fun kind of family crest that they carry with them on their shield. Here's all 36 characters. The only thing left to do now is the background. Thank you again for following along, for your encouragement, for your input, and I'll see you tomorrow with the addition of the tavern behind them and the end of the line work. It's day 12 of working on my fantasy painting that I call the Guild.
And with all 36 characters penciled and inked, it's time to add a background. And I thought I'd put them all in a quintessential fantasy tavern. So I looked up what other people have drawn for taverns and found various photos and 3D renderings and just, there's so many resources out there to inspire you, which is great because I'm not a fan of drawing backgrounds, especially when it has to come out of my head. So anything I could reference really helps. One thing that was really important to me was that the tavern stayed in the background, that it didn't overpower the characters. And one way that I can do that would be to have the contrast, the whites and the blacks, be lower than the main characters. Meaning the whites aren't as white and the blacks aren't as black, less contrast. Another way is for the colors to not be as saturated. Less contrast and lower saturation will give the background a softness to it. And the last way, which you're seeing now, is a thinner line weight for the inking. I'm using a Micron 005 fine liner and I'm keeping my lines as thin as possible in hopes that despite all of the detail that I plan on putting into this background, it doesn't in any way overpower the characters. Which means I want the viewer, you, to see the characters first, and then maybe later on your eyes will look into the background. But the guild members are the stars of this piece, not the tavern behind them. So the lighter line weight and less contrast and desaturated colors will, hopefully, help me guide my audience's eye to what I want, what's important. Another thing I had to do was apply one point perspective, meaning I had a single point that every line kind of pointed to. I selected this little rivet on the autistic centaur's shoulder armor. I think it's called a pauldron. And then from there, I drew all of the floorboards running from this point. I also did it for the bricks or stonework on all the walls and just a general rule for getting my perspective right. And what's crazy is, despite all of this, despite the rulers and the one point perspective and all the preparation that I've put into it, my perspective is still wonky. My lines are wonky. The amount of imperfections and bad perspective and horrible line work that is in this background is mind boggling. But here's the thing. I did not let it stop me from making it. I'm not letting my lack of skill at drawing taverns or backgrounds in general stop me from having fun. So many of you are petrified to get it wrong. You're so afraid of your perspective being off or your proportions being bad or your line work being ugly. And I just want to tell you, as your friend, your perspective will be off, your proportions will be bad, and your line work will be ugly. And that's okay. So is mine. Let your art be wonky, like mine. Make mistakes, like me. And let it go, like me. The best thing I've learned about my art was to let my art be weird. Let it be off. Let it be wonky. Once you stop striving for perfection, you can start really having fun with your art. So please, my friend, please embrace the wonkiness. Oh, and I got a ton of requests for a fairy, and I love fairies, so I added my favorite fairy, which is Kiwi from my comic series, The Dreamland Chronicles. Isn't she adorable? She was so small that I didn't even dare to try to draw facial features, but I can't wait for her pink and yellow stockings. This background took me maybe five days to do, I think, and I spent maybe an hour a day on it, I second guessed where the stairs would lead, what kind of textures to add to the rock walls, how much wood texture to add, all of my proportions, and pretty much everything about it. But I just kept pushing forward with it. My art is so far from perfect, but the maturity of 55 years of doing this has let me be okay with that. And I just wanted to pass that along to you. We don't, as artists, achieve perfection with our art. We achieve acceptance of our art. I kind of like that. I just came up with it and I should probably turn that into a t-shirt or something. So yeah, please stop trying to find perfection with your art and learn to accept how beautiful the wonkiness is in your art. Back to the line weight, I'm wondering if you can see the difference now. Can you see how the thinner line weight, despite all of the detail I'm putting into the background, can you see how the background is softer than the characters and how the characters are remaining relevant and more visible in front? Now, imagine if I did that with gray fine liners instead of black, it would be even softer still. But for now, I think it's working out pretty well. I hope you agree. And the background is done. But I have a bunch of items on my to-do list that I wanna tackle. The first is the extra space above. I just don't need it and I'm gonna cut it out. Next, goat ears for our little fawn and little tiny earrings too. I felt that the mage in the wheelchair needed tattoos and I asked my friend Charlotte what she thought and she asked a bunch of friends and I think the idea that was given to me that I liked the most was dice. So, and this was so tiny, I drew little D4, D6, D8, D10, D12, and D20 
dice with a little flowing Art Nouveau kind of vine tying it all together. And the Little Mice Soldiers, I never heard back from the people who I referenced their miniature from, and I didn't want it to be too close to theirs because it's their it's their creation and I didn't want to steal it. So I changed it up as much as I could and hopefully it's enough to where it's its own thing. And speaking of potential copyright infringement, I added the Sword of Omens from Thundercats and the Master Sword from The Legend of Zelda. Oh, and I think He-Man's shield from the original toy is in there somewhere too. And here's the final background in all of its wondrous wonkiness and imperfections and mistakes and little copyright infringements. <laughs> and here's the final scan. Um, really happy with it. I had such a good time making it and I hope the characters stand out the way I want them to and I hope the tavern is just wonky enough for it to be unique and not too wonky to where it makes people upset. But that's art. That's being human. Next up, watercolors. It's day 13 of working on my fantasy painting that I call The Guild and today I'm painting the background. That's right, I'm finally getting to add some color. I'm so excited. I'm gonna lay down a nice Windsor orange, which is really kind of like an orangey yellow. And the reason why I'm doing this is to make the tavern feel warm and inviting. And remember, watercolors are transparent, so you wanna start off with your lightest colors first and then slowly build up to your darker colors. If I was using an opaque medium like gouache, I'd probably call this layer of Windsor orange my underpainting, but I'm not sure if that's true for something like watercolors. Okay, and now a light pass of Payne's Gray for where the stonework is. The Windsor orange underneath will still show through and give the stonework a bit of warmth. I'm not thinking of lighting or shadows or any kind of effects. I'm just putting the generic coloring down so I can get a feel for the piece. It's just kind of a way for me to lightly see the shapes and how the colors will work together. That's looking good. Okay, so now it's time for the wood. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of burnt sienna to all the parts that have wood. And it's a little tedious, but generally not as tedious as it was to draw it or ink it. And if you notice, I'm using a lot of water in my paints, so it's not too saturated. And remember, there was the lighter lines, there was the lower contrast, and this is the part where I was saying that I would be less saturated in my colors for the background. More water on your brush when you mix your paints means that there'll be less pigment on the paper, less saturation. And now the fun part adding shadows. I like a Windsor Violet for my shadows. I always have, it cools things down and it brings some color to your shadows. You don't wanna use black because it, it'll just mute everything. But Windsor Violet just gives you a nice cool shadow area. And it was somewhere around this point that I thought, I wonder if I should differentiate the color of the stones with the that middle space, what is it called, grout or whatever's in between the stones. And so I decided to come in with a little bit of Payne's Gray on top of the Payne's Gray that I had already done to give a little bit more of definition in that separation between the stones and the space between it. And two things happened when I did that. One, I really liked it. And two, I realized I just gave myself a whole bunch more work that I wasn't planning on doing. I was not planning on adding more variations or detail or anything to the background, but I liked it, so now I have to do it for the whole piece. All of this while trying to keep it subtle and desaturated and soft so that way it doesn't overpower the main characters, the, the guild. But this is me, this is how I work. It's like doing a high wire act without a net. I just, I get a thought in my head and I figure, let's see what happens. And a lot of that is the knowledge that I can fix it. Um, that knowledge of being able to fix something allows me to be adventurous with my art. So as you can see, I've completely abandoned the Windsor Violet, the shading, and I just decided before I do any more, I'm just gonna get all of this part done first, get all the stonework done, and then come in with the shading later. Okay, now that I've got it all done, I can come in with the shading and give it a little bit of depth, give it a little bit of light and shadows, and hopefully that will make it feel more real. And it was somewhere around this point that I was thinking, I need to push this back wall back a bit. And so I started adding a little bit more Windsor Violet. Then I added some deeper reds to darken up the ceiling a bit more, just again, to push it back a little bit. Now to add a little bit of warmth to the fireplace, I don't want it to be too saturated because again, not as important as the characters. 
And there's going to be some light coming from this fireplace, and it's going to affect things like the mastodon or whatever kind of skull this is. It's going to affect that in some ways, as well as the, the wood and some of the other parts of the environment. But I don't want it to be too strong. And that's exactly what happened with the skull. I didn't like it. It was too dark. It was too contrasty. So I started to add some water to it and dab away some of the pigment with a paper towel. Okay, that's a little better. Now to add just a little bit of blue, like whatever an outside color would be to the windows. Again, I don't want white because I want our whitest whites and our blackest blacks to be on the characters and not on the background. And now for one of the Easter eggs, I went and got my He-Man shield and I'm gonna color in this little shield here with the same orange and gray that's on the original toy. And I still think that the skull has too much contrast to it. So I'm gonna try to soak up some more of the paint with some water and a paper towel. Remember, watercolor, just like gouache, are water soluble. You can add water to it and it will liquefy again. So that's all I'm doing is I'm just adding water to it and hoping that I can get enough of it out of the paper. A lot of it's gonna stay soaked into the paper and that's totally fine. I'm just trying to lighten it up. I wanna desaturate it a little bit. I wanna get rid of some of the contrast so that way, again, the characters will be the main subject. So I'm just trying to soften it a little bit more. And I'm gonna take my burnt sienna, which is my brown, and I'm gonna add a little bit of wood grain to the already existing line work of the wood grain, just to give it a little bit of variation, just so you could see a little bit more texture, the difference between a lighter brown and a darker brown, just a little bit, and hopefully that'll give it some subtlety. And now we have the Master Sword from Legend of Zelda and the Sword of Omens from Thundercats. These are so tiny, <laughs> if I could just explain how small these are, which is why they're so wonky and I'm not really spending much time on them. They're just afterthoughts. They're just fun little Easter eggs I'm throwing in the background. And the rest of it is just taking the time to fill in all the little parts. There's so much there, there's the candles on the chandelier and the spackling on the wall and shields and it's just time. I just put on my favorite music and just zone out. It's great. And I wasn't sure what to do with this little area here. I didn't want to make it too complicated so that way Kiwi, our fairy, showed up. But after looking at it, I decided I really didn't want to add like a different texture. We already have stone and we already have wood. So I just decided to make a very, very subtle wood texture and kind of leave some area for a glow to come off of uh, Kiwi, our fairy. And the last little bit was just adding some more wood texture, wood grain to the flooring. I'm trying to keep it really subtle. It's not important. It's not something that I want to draw your attention to. And I hope this is the right way. I hope I'm doing this right. And I think I'm done. I'm done painting the background. Finally, I could start working on painting the characters. So exciting. It's day 14 of working on my fantasy painting that I call The Guild. I wanted to try these concentrated watercolors by Doc Martens because they are so vibrant and a bit more transparent than traditional watercolors. And I like that because I want the ink lines to show through as much as possible. This first character is a dragonborn and from what I've read, their colors are kind of metallic with mostly reds, but they can also be pretty much any color. So I started off with a golden yellow just to kind of give it some warmth underneath and then came over it with a nice, very saturated red. And I don't really use these concentrated watercolors often other than just for like little background bits. So I'm struggling a little bit here as I'm working with it. So I wind up noodling it a little more and a little more. And the more that I noodle it, the more opaque it becomes because I'm just adding layer and layer and layer on top of it. And once I start doing that, I start losing my ink lines. So then of course I bring out the colored pencils and the gouache and I start doing exactly what happened with the dragon and centaur painting. This is not the start that I wanted to for the characters, but again, I'm always expecting that I'm going to ruin it somehow. Um, not in a negative way. It's just kind of, I take a lot of risks with my art. I go, well, I've never tried this before and I just jump right in and do it. So I, I always have the colored pencils. I always have the gouache to kind of fix things if things go crazy. So that's what you're seeing is I tried something and I didn't like it. So I came in with 
uh, a little bit of gouache, a little bit of colored pencils, and I think I saved it okay. Another thing I like to do is keep my palette limited when it comes to costume design. I'll pick usually two colors and try to stick to that for the clothing. In this case, I picked red and blue with gold accents, and that's it. That's the only colors this Dragonborn is gonna wear. And if you look, you'll see that I use traditional watercolors for the clothing. You can see that they're not as vibrant as the concentrated watercolors that I used for the Dragonborn's head. This, I hope, makes the skin of the Dragonborn feel more alive. It's the most saturated bit of the whole piece right now, and that's purposeful. See how much it stands out from the background too? Okay, and this is the part I've been dreading, which is the mage with the wheelchair, because I had to redo the wheel and there's so much acrylic gouache that I wound up adding for the armrest and the front wheel. It's just, I know it's gonna be a pain. Painting the wheel itself is not a problem because it's on nice watercolor paper. So you can see it's really coming out very nicely. It's the edges that I'm worried about where I cut it out. It's literally sitting on top of my painting. But I think it came out okay. And hopefully if you didn't know that I cut it out, you won't be able to notice it. At least that's the hope. So I'm just using my regular watercolors from here on out. I might use the concentrated watercolors for places that really need very, very vibrant colors. But for now, I think all of the skin tones and armor and everything else throughout is gonna be just regular watercolors. And for the dice tattoo, I just thought it would be fun to have each one be a different color. I don't know why, I don't know if the original Dungeons and Dragons that I played back in 1981 had multicolored dice, but in my mind, each dice was a different color, and so that's what I did. And her costume colors are green and purple. I think they complement her red hair really well, and I like it. She has her own style. And this next little fella is definitely giving me teenage dirtbag vibes, but I like it. They're a hobgoblin, and from what I read, hobgoblins have reddish skin, and I thought I didn't want them to compete with the dragonborn skin, which is gonna be a very vibrant uh, color of red. So I gave them more of a pinkish skin, and I don't know why, but I thought green hair would look really cute. And I don't hate it, but it's definitely giving me Oompa Loompa vibes. They've also got a nice nose ring and a couple earrings. And so, I don't like I said, it just gives me kind of a teenage kind of feel. Their color palette is essentially brown with a lighter brown and some gray. Now, the one good thing about doing this night is I don't have to worry about their color palette because they're in armor, which is just gonna be blues and grays. So I think all of the color is gonna be in their skin tones. And so so I'm definitely having a lot more fun with that. There's a lot of reds, a lot of blues, a lot of pinks. When you're painting something very highly reflective or shiny like armor, it's not as interesting as it is when I was drawing it. There's more detail in the drawing than there is actually gonna be in the color palette. But that's why I like it here because we're gonna have so many colorful characters. It's nice to have some characters who are just not that colorful. You have to have some variation between the characters. Some are gonna be dressed a little bit more garishly than others. Some characters are gonna pop a little more than others, but that's what gives it that realism, I think. Okay, and for a last little bit of detail, remember when I said I was saving the whitest whites and the blackest blacks for the characters? This is where I'm gonna come in with a little bit of white gouache just to add some shine, just to add some contrast your eye is just naturally gonna go to the most contrast. It is always gonna go to the whitest whites and the blackest blacks. That's just how nature made us, just how our eyes work. So as artists, if we wanna guide the viewer's eyes towards something, that's where we put the most contrast. That's where we put the blackest blacks and the whitest whites. So our Aetherian character, which in this case is literally a werewolf. I went with more of a gray wolf, more of a darker wolf color. So I'm using Payne's gray for the colors. And while they're wearing a kind of samurai type of outfit, I wanted to keep their colors relatively muted. So I just went with browns and gray. And I think that gives the character a bit more of a rustic kind of feel. They're not very flamboyant. They're not very colorful. I know it may seem silly, but when you're designing characters for anything, you have to think of what their personality is. Certain people dress more colorfully, other people don't. And that should factor into your decision making. Treat your characters as if they were real people or, or werewolves or dragons or, or whatever. But at some point in their life, they decided that they were going to wear certain clothes, that they were gonna dress a certain way. They have taste, uh, whether it's good or bad, they have taste, they have a preference in what they wear. <laughs> it's your job to figure that out. And this final character for today is gonna be in the same color range as our Therian, grays and browns. 
I have characters coming up that I know will be very colorful, both the characters and their clothing, and I need to plan ahead to make sure that, just like personalities can be both loud and soft, people's outfits can either be loud or soft. The same can be said about body language too, and hairstyles for those that have hair. I would know nothing about that. But a truly diverse group of characters is going to have a wide range of loud and soft elements. Anyway, something to keep in mind. I hope you've enjoyed today's update. I'm going to try to get through about four or five of these characters a day. I'm looking to finish the painting by Easter, fingers crossed. I'll try to keep the updates consistent this week, so please check back daily and thank you all for following along as I finish my painting of the Guild. It's day 15 of working on my fantasy painting that I call The Guild. And can I just take a moment to thank you all for your encouragement on this piece? My entire life, and I have to assume this is true for pretty much any artist, I would make a piece of art alone with nothing but my own thoughts. And my thoughts on my own art are never nice. So my whole life I'm making art and while I'm toiling away at the art, the only feedback I would get is my own negative thoughts. And it's tough to push past that, to persevere. But making these videos, talking through my process and seeing the reactions from all of you, and I'm reading all of the comments too, it's such an amazing experience. I'm not left alone with my intrusive and destructive thoughts. And because of this, the painting feels less mine, if that makes sense. It feels like it's ours. So again, thank you. This is such a new and unique experience that I wish every artist could experience. Making a piece of art that you want to make with the encouragement and love from thousands of people from all over the world, pushing you to keep going, telling you you're doing great. I wish every artist could feel this kind of creative joy. Okay, enough of being sentimental. Let's get back to my color choices. <laughs> so I think you saw with the first character, the elf, that I kept their palette Again, very limited. I only used uh, greens and a little bit of brown on the belt, a little bit of gold on the green. And I made sure that their fur wrap was not the same brown as the person below them or gray as the Therian to the left of them. So I kind of gave it more of a lighter fur. And I kind of did the same with our dwarf here. I just gave them gray tones and green tones and a little bit of brown. So I'm keeping it very earthy, very limited in the palette. Though I did give him a nice auburn beard, which I like. And I love the red nose. Also, I'm really happy with how the boots came out. I like those little kind of whatever pointy wedges that I gave to his armored feet. I love dwarves, so this was a fun one. Okay, so this next one is the Middle Eastern Saracen character and for those of you who don't know I am half Assyrian my grandparents came from Iran and I don't know if this is a stereotype or anything but my family always liked very colorful clothing uh, shiny clothing some might call it garish or loud I call it good taste for example here's a picture of me and my 85 year old mom on a day where we accidentally wore the same loud shirts. All that to say, I was looking forward to painting this character because I wanted to somehow capture that color pattern, some some of that taste. And I think that's fun. I think it's always fun to have a little bit of you in a painting. And all of that to essentially say, yeah, that limited color palette was thrown out the window for that character. Also, I haven't decided whether this character is male or female or non-binary or gender fluid or something else. So I'm gonna leave that up to you. Okay, this next character is an air genasi, which is I think kind of like an air genie. And I intentionally wanted the character to have vitiligo, which is a lightening of the pigment of the skin. But I thought it would be kind of fun to see what that would look like with a character with blue skin. And I kind of like it. I think it's kind of a cool look. The hair strands are really tiny, so I probably spent more time than I should just trying to define them a little bit more with the ink lines. And now it's time for our goblin girl. What I was told is she's probably a little too big for a, a, your typical goblin, but I was also told that size is relative. There are big and small everythings, so she's a larger goblin girl. And if you remember, I redid her eyes by painting over them with acrylic gouache. And you can see that there's still white around her eyes where the paint just won't soak into it. So I wound up breaking out the gouache paint so that way I could cover it up somehow. And in doing so, I just feel like her skin tones might have gotten a little bit too dark. 
I don't know. They, they seem a little muddy. I felt like I was overworking it a little too much. I was adding colored pencils and gouache and everything to it. So I decided to just work on her clothes in the meanwhile. And in doing so, I figured I would limit her palette to purples and orangish yellow, my Windsor orange. And I don't know why, but I thought a checker pattern would be fun. I, I don't know why I thought this, but I kind of went for it and I'm, I'm not mad. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump over to the half elf now. I really like the photo reference that I had for this. And so I was excited to paint this one. The proportions of this character are for me a little off. Her head is definitely bigger than the normal proportions of uh, we'll say seven, seven to eight heads per character. And I've known that since since the first time I drew her, but I think that's what I liked about her was her proportions were a bit different. She was unique in her own person. So yeah, just another case of things not being perfect and embracing that. So I've decided I'm gonna redo the Goblin Girl skin color. So I'm breaking out the white acrylic ink. I found that it is very opaque. And when I mix it with something like concentrated watercolors, they blend to make a really nice, smooth and consistent cover up. Okay. Here we go. See, I like this. It's a little bit more saturated and a little bit cleaner. I think she looked a little spotty, I guess, is the best way to describe it. I'm just adding a little bit of highlights and then finish it off with the freckles. What do you think? Before is on the left and the new one on the right. I'm, I'm happy with it, so I guess that's all that matters, but I still love your feedback. And I guess that's day two of painting in the characters. There's 12 of them that I've painted so far, so I guess six a day, that's not bad. So hopefully I'll have this done again by Easter. I'm doing my best. And again, I want to sincerely thank you all for your encouragement and what an enormous blessing that it is to have that kind of feedback and positivity when working on a painting. I've never experienced it before. And again, I wish every artist could experience this. Thank you. It's day 16 of working on my fantasy painting that I call The Guild. And I'm finally getting to paint the tabaxi. The tabaxi is a cat person and I love anthropomorphic characters. I decided on going with a snow leopard or white tiger or just a lighter color rather than your typical orange and yellow Bengal tiger. And for some reason, I thought the color palette would be really nice if it was green and pink. I don't know why. <laughs> it just felt like it might be a nice combination. It's funny, I'll sit and stare at the character and in my mind kind of run through different scenarios of color combinations. I'm also looking at the rest of the painting to see if I've already used that color combination, if it'll look good in that area, things like that. But I can actually in my mind picture the color combinations and for some reason, green and pink seem to work in my head. And now I'm realizing that pink might have been a little too pink, so I'm adding a little bit of Windsor orange to it to make it a little bit more peach. And I totally forgot about the tabaxi's left arm. <laughs> so I'm doing that now. And one thing I always forget when I'm drawing animals is their whiskers. So luckily I remembered this time and I added some whiskers on our little tabaxi. Much better. It's cobalt time. So. Kobolds are apparently these little lizard kind of creatures. They're kind of distantly related to dragons, but uh, from what I remember back when I played Dungeons and Dragons in 1981, they were like one of the first kind of creatures that you would wind up fighting. They're just, uh, they were these like little uh, easier enemies that you would wind up fighting. Kind of like how the Murlocs are in World of Warcraft. Though I don't know if they have the adorable burgle, burgle, burgle sound. So cute. So I thought I'd give our little cobalt hero here bronze armor. I'd never done bronze armor, so hopefully I got it kind of close as far as colors go. I think it's really fun to see the difference from when I played Dungeons and Dragons back in 1981 to how it's played now. A lot of the characters that were essentially the villains are playable characters, and I think that's so cool. I think what that does is that essentially just establishes that every creature has a soul, and all of these characters that my 12-year-old self was killing in uh, 1981 were characters with families and hopes and dreams and desires, and it's just, um, it's really profound. <laughs> okay, moving on. 
This little pirate, I still haven't determined what they are. Um, I don't know if they're part hobgoblin or goblin or orc or what, but they're very tiny. They're pretty short, but I just, I love them. I think they're absolutely adorable and I need help figuring out what race they are. We already know what their profession. They're a pirate. The autistic centaur. This is one that's kind of close to my heart, of course, but um, I was really kind of nervous about working on them. I don't know why. I just, I think uh, sometimes you put a little more pressure on your art than you should. And I think when something feels like it's a little more personal, you put a little bit more pressure on yourself. And I kind of did that with the autistic centaur. Also, while the photo reference to me said female, when my mom saw this, she thought it was a male. And again, I'm gonna leave that open to interpretation. For the color palette, I went for green and tan and brown. And I also went with a white kind of horse part for them. And the ear defenders, I just wanted to make sure that they looked like ear defenders, that you can actually see the strap that holds them in place around their head. And that's our little autistic centaur. No, wait, I spoke too soon. I decided that I wanted to add some spots to the horse parts. So I added some spots to the horse parts. Okay, we're done for now. On to the gnome. Someone had commented that all of the boots are either brown or black and we should have somebody with some brightly colored boots. And I thought, well, who better to have brightly colored boots than the gnome? Because this person is just way too happy and they look like someone who would have very, very bright boots. And speaking of bright, I decided that their color palette was gonna be teal and yellow. Of all of the characters so far, this is the one that I'm the least happy with. I think it's the one I broke away from the photo reference the most and therefore I feel a little less confident about the gnome. And that's okay, I'm gonna have some characters that I'm not as confident about and I just need to accept that and move on. And the final character for today is another Middle Eastern character. And I wanted to differentiate their skin tones by giving them olive skin, which as the name suggests, has a little bit of green to it. They also have a scar. Um, I know uh, several of you have asked to have a character with a scar. And the color palette that I decided for this character was a little bit more muted than the Saracen, the, the other Middle Eastern character. So this one is mostly just yellows, orange, and Payne's gray. And this character brings us to 18 characters painted. So that's our halfway mark, because I think I'm doing 36 or 37 characters total. And when this painting is done, hopefully by Monday, I'll scan it all in and get it ready for making it into a poster. So if any of you are interested in having this piece on your wall, I'm gonna make a poster at the same size that the painting is, which is 11 by 30 inches. Please let me know if that's something that you'd like to do. Oh, and another thing, when this is done, I'd love it if we can get together and figure out each character's name and background and their story, if that sounds fun to you. Thank you again for following along. And hopefully if I can stay at six characters per video, we'll be done with this painting in three more videos. So I look forward to seeing you next time. It's day 17 of working on my fantasy painting that I like to call the Guild. And this group of characters I lovingly call the party people because they all seem to be having a really good time. The first one is this giant character, which I think is considered a Goliath. I guess they're like distant relatives to giants. And while this isn't the first character with tattoos, this is the first character with facial tattoos. While I was painting this character during the live, I was asked, how do I come up with the color palettes for the characters? And honestly, all of the inspiration starts off with the photo reference. Then from there, I might look at the surrounding characters or surrounding colors and see if that matches. Maybe I've used too much red already in the painting, so I wanna try something else. Or maybe I think that that character might like something with a different pattern or different color or something. I'll almost always change something or most of the times everything when it comes to the colors or even the clothing. But having good photo reference to at least give you a good starting point is so helpful. And next up is our little fairy, Kiwi, from the Dreamland Chronicles. And this is literally the only character in the guild that I actually know who they are. I know everything about them because it's a character that I've created before for my book series, The Dreamland Chronicles. And for those of you who don't know about The Dreamland Chronicles, it's a webcomic that I created for my twin boys back in 2006. It's my favorite thing that I've ever done. And you could read it on thedreamlandchronicles.com. You don't have to, but 
There's like 2,400 pages of web comics there. I finished the series in 2016. Okay, and now for the Kender. As I was working on this character, I realized that the character behind them, I was missing their legs somehow just forgot to draw it. So I did a quick little sketch on the tracing paper so I can kind of get an idea of where their leg would be, but realized that the stool that the Kender is on is already where their leg should be. So I kind of had to move their foot a little bit further behind. So they're maybe standing with one leg behind and that's okay. That's just art, right? We're human, we're gonna make mistakes. And I have to not only tell this to all of you a lot, I have to tell this to myself a lot. Every time I'm making art, I have to remind myself that mistakes are gonna happen, or as Bob Ross would call them, happy little accidents. Though, to be perfectly honest, I never really understood the whole happy little accidents thing because I was never, and I never have been, and I never will be happy for any of my accidents or mistakes. Just being honest here. Bob Ross was definitely a better man than me. Oh, and my apologies if my voice is a little gravelly. I wasn't feeling good the last couple days and it's a little scratchy, but I'm okay, I'm, I'm feeling fine. It's just my voice might sound a little gravelly, so. So this character, I, I don't know who they are. I don't know what they are. I have not been able to pinpoint anything about them. So I am desperately looking forward to your input on who this character is. I decided to go with cool colors for their costume because I thought it would complement their warm colors of their skin. And since the Kender behind them is stealing one of their pearls or jewelry, I wanted to make the jewelry pop a little more. So I pulled out the gouache to hopefully make the jewelry stand out a little bit more. I hope it worked. It's so tiny. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's feathers in their hair too. And it's so hard to see that kind of detail, but I'm doing the best I can with how small it is. Now, moving on to the halfling or hobbit, as I like to call them, I decided to give them cooler colors as well for their costume. I thought maybe teal would be a nice color for their blouse, but then I went with a deeper red for the dress or lower part. And red isn't usually a cool color, but when you add some purple to it, it really kind of cooled it down. So with halflings or hobbits having large bare feet with a lot of hair on them, I thought let's add a little bit of nail polish to the toes because why not? And now for our shifter. I originally thought they were changeling, but apparently that's a shifter. I decided that what I wanted to do was give them kind of a pale green skin color. And I added some pink to kind of make it feel a little bit more natural, a little more fun, but I don't know. I just thought let's try something that was not your traditional skin color for this character. And the shirt, I just kept changing a couple times until I kind of came up with a color combination that I, I liked, which was a little bit more of a purplish red. So I started off with a light blue, didn't like it, went over it with a Windsor orange, didn't like that, went over it with purple, didn't like that, and finally broke out the Doc Martens concentrated watercolors. And when I was finally happy with the colors, it was so dark that I had to start adding some gouache to bring some highlights back into it. So many of you have requested that the Hobbit and the Shifter are a couple. And I love this idea. So as far as everyone's concerned, these two are an adorable couple who apparently like to drink, but they're adorable and I love them. So the color palette for the Shifter, I just went with that deep purplish red and the same color that I gave them for their hair, their, their kind of blondish hair, I made that the color for their dress bottom part. I don't know, oh, is that called a skirt? I think that's a skirt. And I'm gonna add a little bit more of that purplish red to the skirt part for a pattern. And we have six more characters done. Now there are only 13 more characters to go. And I have to tell you, I kind of don't want it to end. So part of me wants to get this done quickly so I can make posters, but the other part of me is really enjoying just spending some time with this group of friends. I like it here, it's cozy. Anyways, thanks again for hanging out with me and my friends in the guild. It's day 18 of working on my fantasy painting that I call the guild. And this first character I'm painting is called a drow, spelled D-R-O-W. And it is like a dark elf from what I'm told. And I didn't do too much research on it other than they're kind of like the emo elves, I think. They're, they're the... Uh, the, just the darker, more gothic kind of uh, elves. So I thought it would be fun to make someone who is supposed to be so dark and serious make them a bard. I don't know why I found that humorous, but 
I did. Drows are supposed to have a dark purplish skin and white hair, which is kind of a cool color combination. So I thought I would try a green and kind of a reddish for the color combination for their clothing. And the first couple passes were just too light. They were too watercolory. And remember that watercolors are transparent. So sometimes you have to build them up a little bit more to get that saturation that you like. And once I had it as saturated as I wanted, I started to add a little bit of gouache just to add some highlights. And I thought it'd be fun to give our little drow plaid pants. I don't know why. In hindsight, I could have made it a kilt, but I kind of already drew it as pants. But now that it's plaid pants, for some reason it reminds me of pajama pants. I don't know why I maybe had some pajama pants that were plaid at one point. But I still think he came out okay, and he's the most metal bard that I've ever drawn. He's also the only bard I've ever drawn. Next up is our kindly elderly orc. And for those of you who don't know, any likeness that this character has to me is purely absolutely unintentional. Seriously, I had no plan of inserting myself into anything, but I think it's kind of a funny little coincidence. I decided I'm gonna go with two of my favorite colors, which is Windsor Orange and Windsor Purple. I still haven't figured out what kind of profession this character is, but Based on the robes, uh, I would assume some sort of not fighter, but maybe more of a mage or something. I don't know. Whatever their profession is, I'm sure they just want to use their skills to make their world a better place. And now it's non-binary tiefling time. I guess this is technically the second time that I've painted this character since I used the same photo reference for the test at the beginning of the series. I don't know why, but I really like how their face came out. And I really wanted to give them rosy cheeks and a nice red nose. And I liked the pink that I used so much that I decided that would actually be a really nice hair color. And you know what? I think I was right. I struggled a bit on the outfit colors because I was actually using the same photo reference that I used for the autistic centaur. And while I didn't use the color palette for the centaur exactly as it was in the photo reference, I was pretty close. So I needed to come up with something a little different for the tiefling. And for the skirt slash kilt area, I thought, well, I've got plaid again. Why not use the non-binary flag colors? So I did. And I can't do that for every character. It would just be too forced. But if it feels natural and it works for the character, I'm gonna do it. Because this is my fantasy world that I'm painting for me. And these are the kind of characters that I want in my world. Okay, it's Kenku time. A Kenku is a crow-like character. And this one in particular, for some reason, gave me stabby vibes. I don't know why, they just seem like, um, I, they seem to wanna stab people. I don't know why. I don't know why I get that feeling from them. I also kind of felt that they would have a very monochromatic palette for their clothes. Their taste didn't seem to be flashy or anything, and so I just gave them just a deep red and brown kind of palette for uh, whether it's leather or something, but I kept it very minimal. The Kenku just seemed like a very no-nonsense, stabby type of character. I'm sure we've all met a person who seems very stabby. I'm sure we all know somebody, or some of you are somebody, who like to stab things. This next character is an elf, I, I assume, by their ears. And for some reason, they have a, a real quietness to them. And a few of you have pointed out that they're looking over to the autistic centaur. Which was another happy coincidence because now they're officially friends. Someone else also mentioned that maybe they are deaf. And I like that too. And I even considered changing their arm to have their hand up, maybe doing some ASL. But I'm not sure if it's too late at this point. So I'm considering it, but... I haven't 100% decided. So while I was painting this, I was having some problems with the brown, with the burnt sienna, and it just was not looking good. I had just bought a new tube, the first I'd had to buy in a couple years. And when I poured it out, it was all runny. It was disgusting. And it went on all gloopy and shiny for some reason. So I removed it, I just added some water, and it came off really easily, like it never soaked into the paper. Look at that, can you see how shiny it is? It's not supposed to be like that, and it's dry, see? So I scooped the paint out of my palette and poured out a bunch more, and this time it came out in two colors. And yes, this is really disgusting because it's brown too. I mixed it up as best as I could and the, it got darker. Seriously, this is so disgusting. And I tried painting with that again. It wasn't good, it just didn't feel like my normal burnt sienna watercolors. Finally, it didn't dry with a gloss, but it still didn't look great. But I did my best to finish out the piece and I'm gonna take it back to the art store and see if I can exchange it for a good one. 
I have no idea what happens, but this is the kind of thing that happens with traditional art. Sometimes you just get a bad batch of something. I don't know. It happens. Sometimes you feel like everything's against you and sometimes everything goes well. You have no real control over that. But if you keep making art, even when things go bad and even when your paint's bad, you'll learn how to overcome that. You'll, you'll find ways around that and it'll become less stressful, I promise. And that's where we are today. We have eight more characters to go and the painting will be done. Thank you all for following along, for your encouragement and your love, and for helping me get to the end of this painting that I call The Guild. It's day 19 of working on my fantasy painting that I like to call The Guild. And this is it. This is the final eight characters to paint. And I'm going to be honest with you, I've been kind of slow playing this. I did not want to finish it. I'm having so much fun that I don't want this painting to be done. This character is another dwarf and I have a lot of fans in India. So we made this dwarf hopefully a good representation of Indian people. I was even asked to add a bindi to her forehead. So I did. I kept her color palette to a burgundy, a little bit of Payne's gray and the green for her cloak. And normally burgundy, Payne's gray and green are not combinations that I would use. I think the burgundy and the Payne's gray look good together, but the green cloak uh, just didn't really click with me. But I also figured that not everybody has the same color sense that I do. So I'm kind of letting this character pick the colors that they want. I just, I think that if you're gonna have 38 or 39 characters, not everybody's gonna have really good fashion sense. And um, so I, I let this character go with a color that I didn't approve of. And I'm okay with that, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay with it. And next is our Undead Enchantress. And if you notice, I'm not using any warm colors for her skin. I want her to look I, I guess it's undead. And for her clothing, I really wasn't sure what color I should do. So I kind of <laughs> avoided it for a little bit. And then eventually I decided on purple. I figured it's a cool color and I wanted to keep her overall palette cold. I added a little bit of warm touches just on the collar and the jewelry. And it's orange because orange and purple are complementary colors. So let's just say that our undead character has a little better fashion sense than our dwarf or maybe that their fashion sense is to die for I'm, I'm just throwing it out there now we have our elderly turtle character someone had mentioned that the sticks in her hair could be used to sew sweaters for everybody in the guild and that is officially canon this character definitely 100 sews sweaters for everybody in the guild so they could stay nice and warm when they're out adventuring and for their skin and shell color i went with green and pinks because I liked it. And for their clothes, I went with yellow and pink. And if you watch, what I do is I do the base colors first. So I did the yellows first and now I'm doing the pinks next. And then what I'll do is I'll come in with the shadows on top of that. And essentially what this means is I really just have to do the shadows once. I don't have to match what the pinks would look like in shadow and what the yellows would look like in shadow. I just come over it with the purple and I have my lighting. It's a very quick way of doing it. But please remember that you do have to dry it first. You have to blow dry it. You have to make sure that your colors are set. They're soaked into the paper. And then you go over it with a layer of purple. And it's just, that's how I always do my shadows. And you could do multiple layers too. If you wanna do various layers of shadows, you can add that lightly, just do light layers of purple. And we are now to the artificer who is like a mechanic, an inventor. And I tried to make them very pale because I figured they're gonna spend a lot of time indoors inventing and mechanicking and artificing as only artificers do, I suppose. And for their outfit, I wanted to go with a red and gold kind of theme, but the <laughs> red came out very pink. And when I went over it again with another red, it came out very red. So it's very, very saturated. I'm hoping that when I come in with the shadows, it'll soften it up a little bit. But this was, yeah, this is very, very red. And they have so many little tools and gadgets and everything on their body. I had to keep re-inking it so I wouldn't lose the detail. And a little colored pencil for the yellow accents and then the purple for the shadows. And I guess it helped a little bit. I might wind up softening it, desaturating saturating it a little bit more when it gets into Photoshop. And yes, I know that he still only has four fingers on his prosthetic hand, but I kind of liked it. I felt uh, maybe 
Five Fingers was overkill for him. It's Fawn time. This is our Fawn Bard. And I wanted to give her a little bit darker skin, almost like a fur type of skin. So I added a little bit of the Burnt Sienna, the one that was all mushy yesterday. And I think it's working out okay. I think I mixed it up enough to where it's not broken anymore. And I thought I'd give her blue hair because why not? And it's at this point that I realized that she has the same horns as the tiefling. I hope that's not a problem. I just, apparently that's just how I draw horns now. And for some reason I decided that green and white would be a good combination for her dress. Well, I know why. It's because the photo reference had a green and white dress. Mystery solved. And at this point I'm just getting really anxious because I really want to work on the Aarakocra. That's the bird person behind her. And I'm just looking at those wings going, I really want to paint that. I really want to paint that. But I'm also realizing that this is the end of this painting pretty much. So I'm just sitting here noodling all the little details of the fawn's jewelry and hair and everything. Until finally, it's Aarakocra time. <laughs> I have no idea if I'm even saying that right. Aarakocra. Aarakocra. So I decided that I just wanted to use Payne's Gray for the feathers and I like it. I think it's a nice look. It's not too colorful. It's very majestic. And I'm just going to slowly build it up with layers and layers of Payne's Gray with each layer getting a little bit more and a little bit more darker. And with each layer, I leave a little bit more of the previous layer visible, so I'm not covering as much area. And it's at this point that I feel that I might have covered up a little too much of the ink line, so I'm adding a little bit of texture to it with some light blue colored pencil. Now a little bit of purple to add a little bit more color to it. And then their clothing, which is gonna be just a combination of warm colors, burgundies, oranges, and gold and a little bit of shadows, and then I think I'm done. I'm done with the Aarakocra. Now I'm just gonna grab some lemon yellow acrylic gouache because I wanna add some electricity or some sort of magic coming from the Enchantress's fingers. So I needed something opaque to go over the transparent watercolors. Going over it with watercolors just wouldn't have done it. Now another way I could have done that was to use a masking liquid around the area that I wanted this to stay light and then lifted that up when I was done painting and that area that I would have had the liquid masking would have stayed white. But for me, it's the same thing for me to just paint with gouache on top of it because one way or another, I'm still taking a paintbrush and I'm still brushing that particular area. So you can paint the liquid masking or you could paint with gouache. It's the same thing to me. Oh, almost forgot the shadows underneath the characters. Much better. And finally, it's time for our little warrior mice. And can you see where I had the acrylic gouache, how the paint isn't soaking in? It just, it just doesn't match up. So I decided to repaint the whole head with gouache. Again, gouache is my go-to when I mess up with watercolors. And it's good to have something that you know you can go to to fix your mistakes because you're gonna make mistakes. We all do. Oh, and I wanted to show you how small this is. They're the size of my thumb. It's so crazy how small this is. But I think I rescued them. I think they came out pretty well. And now for the mouse warrior number two. I'm really looking forward to what kind of backstory that we have for these two. I think it's going to be really fun. These two, these two have been through some things. And as I finish the last little bits of this painting, it's, it's a bittersweet feeling. I've been working on this painting for four weeks now and I'm a little sad that it's almost over. I woke up every morning so excited to go down into the hobbit hole and add a little bit more to the painting. And with these last few brush strokes, I I won't be able to do that again. I know I'm just noodling at this point so that the painting's not over, but I thought, well, what if I had a little bit of a highlight, like as if my signature was etched into the tavern floor? I know it's silly, but what are you gonna do? Okay, I guess there's nothing else to do but take the tape off. Oh, it's so sad. It's when you know you're really done is when the tape comes off. And that's it. She scanned in and done. 37 characters and four weeks of my life. Thank you all for following along. Thank you all for your encouragement and your support and ideas and suggestions. I am gonna make a poster of this. I'm talking to the printer right now. I'll make a short or a video announcing when it's ready. Oh, and as soon as I can figure out how to do it, I want to come up with names and histories and backgrounds for each character with all of you. I just need to figure out how to do that. So stay tuned and thanks again.